Bună seara și bine ați venit la emisiunea Ba Alexa. În această seară avem o emisiune specială în care este invitat dr. Richard Stallman, fondatorul proiectului GNU și de asemenea fondatorul Free Software. Good evening Richard, welcome at Nashul TV. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think in Romanian it's program liber or something like yes, that? Yes, it's a, a, a free program. Yes, because it's really important to say it using your superior Romanian word, which only means free as in freedom. Yes, yes, it's very important. If you use the English important. word free, you get the ambiguity of that English word. What good is that? <laughs> uh, we consider that uh, uh, we are free if uh, we used our freedom. Uh, so, Richard, uh, what can you tell us about yourself? Well, I was an operating system developer, and in 1983, I saw that all the operating systems had become proprietary. That means the users had no control over them. So I decided to correct that problem by writing another operating system and making it free, freedom-respecting software. And that system is GNU, and now it's used in millions of computers. So we have made a step forward for freedom. A uh, 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 big step. Well, it's a pretty big step, but we have to make several more big steps if we want the users of computers to be free. What is uh, the free software and why does it matter? Well, first of all, free software is liber, not gratis. <laughs> it's a matter of freedom, not price. So think of free speech, not free beer, if you want to understand free software. With software, there are two possibilities. Either the users control the program or the program controls the users. The first case is free software. The other case is proprietary software. Well, why is free software the case where the users control the program? Because in order to control the program, the users need certain freedoms. So those are the definition of free software. There is freedom zero, the freedom to run the program as you wish. Freedom one is the freedom to study the plans of the program, the source code, and change it to make the program function and do your computing the way you wish. Well, these two freedoms give the users individual control. So you would be free to change, to make the program do what you want it to do for you. But individual control is not enough, for one thing, because most users aren't programmers. Like, you're probably not a programmer. You wouldn't know how to change a program. It would, if we just gave you individual control, it wouldn't be enough. We need collective control, too, which means any group of users could work together to maintain their version of the program and make it do what they together wish. And then they could also invite other people to use their version. In order to have collective control, we need two additional freedoms. Freedom two is the freedom to redistribute exact copies. And freedom three is the freedom to distribute your modified versions. So these allow the people who choose to make a group to work together and also to invite everyone else. And when I say a group, that group could be two users, it could be a whole country or anything in between. So the effect is, <clears throat> with, with free software, the users control their computing. But if they don't have these freedoms, then the users don't control the program and they don't control their computing. Instead, the program controls the users and the owner controls this compute, the program. Sorry, the owner controls the program and the program controls the users. And so, in effect, this program is an instrument giving the owner power over the users. This is injustice. This is why non-free software should not exist. And our goal is to help everybody escape from non-free software and come to the free world.
come to the free world. Uh, how much is uh, the GNU software used worldwide today? It's not easy to measure that because after all, anybody can redistribute it, anybody can run it or not, and they don't have to tell us. So nobody, because people are free, we can't count them. But we know that there are parts of the world where the public schools have switched to free software. For instance, there are two regions of Spain, Extremadura and Andalusia, where the public schools switched to free software. In part of India, called Kerala, which is a state with some tens of millions of people in it, the public schools have switched to free software. Ecuador is working on switching the public schools to free software. I don't know how far they have got. So, of oh, the city of Munich is very happy with switching to the GNU plus Linux operating system. So these people. are just some examples. Obviously, there are a lot more, but I don't know who they are. And in Romania? Well, there are users of free software. There's a group called Chata, which campaigns for free software in Romania. But uh, I don't know how many people or how many companies use free software. Okay. Should uh, we make it our goal to spread computer uh, literacy? That goal can be good or bad. It depends whether you're teaching people to use free software or proprietary software. You see, the presence in a country of people who have never used Windows and have never used the I things is a national resource because those people could learn a free system like GNU plus Linux just as easily as they could use a, learn to use a user subjugating system. Teaching them Windows or the I things is destroying and wasting this resource. So when we consider the, quest, the idea of including people in a digital society, we have to ask, is it a free digital society or is it a tyrannical one? And including people in the free digital society is good. Including them in a tyrannical digital society is bad. And so when the software tyrannizes the users, I say the goal should be digital extraction, not digital inclusion. Uh, it's technology progress a good thing? It can be or not. You see, innovations are good for us if we get to decide which ones we use. Because then we won't use the ones that are bad for us. And all the ones we use will be good for us, or at least we'll think they are. We could be mistaken, but usually we won't be. However, that's not the way it is nowadays. Nowadays, companies are deciding which innovations to foist on us. And they choose the ones that are good for them, and that's not necessarily good for us. But they decide what choices we get. So they might say, you get to have this convenience if you accept total surveillance. Or they might even set up the total surveillance without giving us any convenience. So there are a lot of innovations which are simply harmful to society. Maybe governments decide they want these innovations, and those governments may not care about our freedom. I read recently that the U.S. has developed a camera with gigapixels. It's a digital camera that can watch an entire city at once and see everybody walking around and watch all the cars driving around. They put, the idea is they put this in a drone and they just keep the drone over the city and they see everything. Well, this is worse than Stalin could ever do. It's like Orwell. Yes. <laughs> and so we have to reject the mistaken idea that our goal should be advance of technology. Advancing technology is only a desirable goal when the people control what technology is used in their lives. It's a reverse. Uh, people uh, uh, are controlled uh, in, 
by the, uh, the software? Well, with non-free software, if you're using non-free software, then it controls you. Of course, that's not the only way technology can be harmful. For instance, the drones watching the entire city, well, the, soft, the drone doesn't belong to you, and the yes, software won't belong to you. So it doesn't actually affect you whether that software is free or not. It affects the state. You see, the state is a big user of computers and software. And if the software used by the state is non-free, well, that software controls the user, and the user is the state. So in that case, the state's computing is under the control of the owner of that program through that program. And that is another kind of injustice. Yes. So the state is supposed to exist to serve the people. The purpose of the state is to organize society for the freedom and well-being of the people. And every state agency exists to do a part of this job. Well, these state agencies often do computing, and they do it for the people. And they often do it about the people. Well, it's their duty, their responsibility to maintain full control of that computing and never let it fall into private hands. Because if it falls under private control, then the state can't assure that it's done right for the people. It can't fulfill its duty. So the use of any non-free program in a state entity, which, which includes state agencies, but also some other kinds of entities controlled by the state or set up by the state, uh, well, <clears throat> that is a dereliction of the state's duty. However, when the state sets up a system like a drone to watch the whole city or cameras in all the streets to watch the whole city, they're using technology to oppress the people. Of course, they always say they're going to catch criminals with it or they're going to catch terrorists with it if there are any. Occasion Once in a while there is a terrorist, but the danger of a, a state that's too powerful is present all the time. The state is much more powerful than some non, some terrorists that don't have state support, or not of the country you're in. So, uh, which is the bigger danger? Now, we've got to be concerned with all the dangers, and we have to recognize which ones are big and which ones are small. Romanians should be aware how much harm a state can do. And what we can do? I don't know. <laughs> right? This is the big problem of politics today. We have states that are democratic in form, but not democratic in substance. Well, I don't know how to fix that. I figure that if we get in, well, first of all, a big part of the problem is the states have been corrupted by business. So in form, it's democracy. In substance, it's plutocracy. Well, if we take away the political power of business, they will say the sky is going to fall. They will say, if you don't let us have all of our influence, it will be a disaster. Therefore, if they are not saying that these measures will cause a disaster, that means you're not attacking them enough. This is the first heuristic. If the businesses are not all screaming, saying, if you take away this power, if you tax us more, if you don't let us have this kind of influence, it's a disaster. That means you're not doing enough. Very interesting. March to the sound of the business executive screams. <laughs> It's uh, uh, how can using network services can harm our freedom? Well, there are two ways network services can mistreat you. One, well, actually, I should make it three. One is through surveillance, because a lot of network services collect information about you that you don't even know they're collecting. For instance, many websites 
just by visiting the site, give information about you to other companies. Now you might realize you're going to go to a certain company's site and give your name. You'd realize that company's going to know you who you are because you told it. You may not realize that a bunch of other companies are going to get information about you because the web page itself is set up to tell them. Often it tells them through JavaScript code, which is a program in the web page itself that runs in your computer if you don't block it. Why always block it? I won't let that, that software run in my computer. But there, is a, there are other ways too. For instance, if you look at a web page and you see a Facebook like button, that means Facebook knows you visited that page. So Facebook is doing surveillance on you with the cooperation of the site that you're visiting. How it works is pretty simple. The image of the button itself comes from a Facebook server. So your machine contacts the Facebook server to get that image and as the image comes in, of course, the Facebook server knows your machine, the machine you're using, requested it. But if you're using a machine at home it, it, and it always has the same internet address, well, it probably already knows that that's your machine. So just by knowing that address, it knows it's you and it knows which page requested the like button because when your browser says show me this image of the like button it says which page it's asking for so Facebook knows you visited that page we're developing a browser that's going to prevent this problem but in any case what you see is that there's a lot of surveillance going on and advertising nowadays typically is based on surveillance <clears throat> so that's one abuse. Another abuse is that the site itself will ask for a lot more information often than it really needs to know because they have design, especially if you're communicating with other people, they often design the sites to make you give information that isn't necessary. And often if the site is for making contact with other people to do business with, they'll collect all the information about you because that's what they really want. They want information about you. They don't want to let you tell the person you might be doing business with. They want to get it. I won't use those. So the next question is once they have information, whether for legitimate reasons or not, what do they do with it? Well. If it's a U.S. company, it hands all that information over to the FBI without even a court order because there is an unjust law in the U.S. that has attacked our freedom, our privacy rights, but also yours if you're using a U.S. company or if you're using a European country, sorry, European company, but it hosts its ser server in a US hosting company and the server is in the US it's the same thing and the US has a policy of copying all the network traffic between the US and other countries and also any messages that go through the US between two other countries they all get copied by the National Security Agency so basically your data will be abused if the US has anything to do with it this doesn't mean any other countries are better, it just means I don't know about them. So abuse of your data is another big threat. Another way network servers can hurt you is they can take control of your computing. Now remember, the point of free software is it gives the users control over their computing. But that assumes you're doing your computing in your own computer running your copy of a program because you can't possibly have control over my copy of a program and you shouldn't but that means if you let a network service do your computing your own computing activities that are personally yours you're handing control over those activities to whoever runs the server because he decides what put what programs to put in that server and of course why should you have control over his server you shouldn't but the fact is, as long as he has control over it, you must not do your computing in his server. To have control over it, you've got to do it in your own computer with your copy of a program 
of various programs, and of course they have to be free software. So there are two ways you can lose control of your computing. You can lose control if the programs you're running are proprietary, because then the users don't control them, they control you. But you also lose control if you hand your computing jobs over to servers. Now the European Union is considering an update to its data protection law. The data protection directive actually was drawn up at a time when the way companies got data about you is you would write it on paper and mail it to them and they would have somebody type it in and put it in their own computer. So the data protection directive makes sure they, they respect your privacy with the data they've got in their own computer but it fails to cope properly with today's computing practices. For instance, it doesn't handle the problem that just by looking at the website, they, the company set it up that you give information to other companies. Those companies didn't get it from them, they got it straight from you, but that company which runs the website set it up so that you would give the, in, the information to the other companies without your even knowing. Well, the Data Protection Directive should ban that. The next step is, <clears throat> that if they host their server in the US or if it's a US company you know whatever also but if, if it's a European company and it hosts its server in the US they're effectively giving all that data to the US government which doesn't obey EU data protection either and they're they're, and if they're also giving it to an, a U.S. company which isn't bound by European data protection. So they've got to make it cover that and say, you can't host your server in any place that isn't covered by equally good data protection laws. However, the companies that, are, that do internet surveillance and advertising, like Facebook and Google, I presume it's them and, and as well as many others, are lobbying the European Parliament and what I've read is the Parliament committees are accepting big pieces of text and putting it into the draft to make the directive fail to do its job. So you citizens of European countries must take action right away. It's a kind of a trap. Well, it's an example it's of plutocracy. It's an example of the political power of business. And to restore democracy, we have to take away the political power of business in every form that it exists. Uh, we, uh, we can fight for the civil rights. Now, how to win this battle? I don't know because they already have control over most institutions. But the first step, I think, has to be teaching more people to stand up for cutting the power of business. Now, you're fortunate in Romania that you are not using the euro. Yes. Because that's another disastrous scheme. We are happy for it. I, you know, when I saw the euro appear, I just thought, oh, this is awfully convenient. I won't have to keep changing money when I travel around Europe. It's very convenient for individuals, but the, the fiscal scheme behind it is a recipe for making every economic downturn worse. Exactly. Um, what about the software in cell phones? Well, a cell phone today is a computer. Now it could be a smartphone, which means that users are invited to install software in it. Or it might be a non-smartphone, which means the users can't install any software in it, it just has what it has. But in all cases, it's software. It's a computer running software, and that software can be changed by somebody else. So even if you can't install software in, that, in your phone, there's a company that can remotely install software in that phone. This is called a backdoor. And in fact, it's a particular kind called a universal backdoor. A backdoor means somebody can send commands to, the, to your computer and tell it to do things. If they can tell it to 
change the software, that's a universal backdoor because they can do absolutely anything. First, they just install the change software to do it, and then they say do it. So they can do absolutely anything to you. And cell phones have been turned into listening devices remotely in this way. In addition, the software has tracking features. On remote command, they will transmit the GPS location information. So these are two malicious functionalities in almost all cell phones. And the only way we could prevent this is if all the software in the cell phone is free. Now, we can't do this at the moment, and the problem is that cell phones have some secret hardware in them. In order for us to write free software to run a piece of hardware, we need to know how to use that hardware. We have to know what the commands are. What should a program do to make that hardware run? Well, that's what's secret. So it's a common practice that they will sell you hardware and they refuse to tell you how to use it. Instead, they offer you a non-free, in other words, user subjugating program and say, to use our hardware, run this program, which of course you shouldn't do. So we at this point are struggling to try to bring about the existence of some computer that doesn't need any non-free software in it. It used to be easier. Things have been moving in a direction where even the manufacturer of a chip can't tell people how to use that chip, even if it decides to do so, because it doesn't know. Or if it does know, it, it got the information from another company which said it's not allowed to say. So the result is there's one company that makes a design for part of a chip, and then the next company makes the chip, and the next company builds that into a computer, and the next company sells us that computer. And that means the company which we have to convince to, ch to change its behavior is three steps away from the company that we actually buy from. How can we pressure them? This is a really bad problem. Yes. It's a and I don't know what to do about it. Now, I think it would be good for the European Union to adopt a directive saying anyone who sells you a computer must give you the specs for how to run, for how software runs the hardware. And that would solve the problem because all these companies would realize we better change what we're doing and they would change it. They would, they would change in a year. Um, we come back uh, after uh, publicity. Uh, am revenit din pauza publicitară și continuăm uh, să discutăm cu dr. Richard Stallman despre uh, proiectul GNU și uh, Free Software. Uh, Richard, uh, what is the difference between uh, open source and free software? <coughs> they're mostly names for the same software and different, but they're totally different philosophies. So there are two different levels here. There's a definition of free software, which I gave you. It's the program comes with these four freedoms. Of course, we've had to interpret the definition for various kinds of cases. So we drew a line saying, these are the programs that are free and those are not. Well, the people who talk about open source, they drew the line at a slightly different place. There are a few programs that are open source, but they're not free. You probably won't come across them, but there are some. But the big difference is at the level of philosophy, and that's why they made that other term. They wanted our philosophy, which is based on the freedom of the users, to be forgotten. So they came up with another name. And since they were using a different term, they had the opportunity to choose the, the ideas to associate with their term. So they chose to present it purely as a practical matter and not raise our ethical issues. So instead of saying, you deserve to control your computing, so reject the software that takes that control away, reject the software that gives someone else power over you, they say, 
that if the users are allowed to change and redistribute the software, it, they will improve the quality of the code, so it will tend to be more powerful and reliable. So they are appealing to these secondary practical values. And they don't present it ever as a matter of injustice that we have to end. So that's why I won't use their term. But the problem is there's so many of them, and they have the support of the mainstream media, at least in the US and in some other countries. So the result is the free software movement gets hidden in the U.S., you will hardly ever see the term free software except coming from a few supporters of free software. They all say open source. When they talk about me, they give the impression I'm a supporter of open source. In fact, a couple of days ago, I saw an article that called me the open source pope, <laughs> which is like talking about the... Uh, the orthodox pope. There isn't one. <laughs> they don't think we're all wrong. Uh, yes. Uh, how can people contribute to the free software movement? Because it's a movement. Yes. Um, well, one way is, say, uh, programming liberty. Just by saying that term, you're showing people that this is an issue about freedom that spreads our philosophical idea. But you can also contribute in, by doing work in various ways. For instance, there's technically, if you're a programmer, well, go to gnu.org slash help and you'll see suggestions for how you can contribute technically. Write software for us, improve existing software. We have a list of high priority projects, but you can also help in the political organizing side of things. You know, you can join Chata and uh, participate in their activities. You can join the Free Software Foundation. You can join FSF Europe. You can participate in our political activities. You can learn to give talks, give speeches, about free software and spread the word. And you can write articles about free software issues. You can campaign for your schools to move to free software. GNU.org slash help gives information about these things too. And this is actually the, the most scarce part of our work. Uh, sure, we would like more people to write free software. But what we really need more of are the free software organizers and activists. Because after all, there are lots of people who are supporters of open source who are contributing to programs that are free. So in terms of a technical contribution, it doesn't matter what the person's politics are. We're happy to get the contribution. We don't ask, why did you choose to write this? We say, thanks. But the people who are supporters of open source, they are not spreading the free software idea. What is the difference between uh, Linux and uh, GNU? Well, most of the time when people say Linux, they're talking about GNU and they don't know it. It's a big confusion that started in 1992. You see, in 19 84, I started the development of the GNU operating system. Well, an operating system is a collection of hundreds or thousands of different programs. And so I recruited people to write these programs. Some of them I wrote myself. And in some cases, I saw people had written the program and I convinced them to make it free. And in other cases, somebody released a free program for other reasons and it was able to fit into the system. By 1992, we had almost all of the system, but one major essential component was missing. This component is called the kernel. The kernel of the operating system allocates the computer's resources to all the other programs that you run, including the other parts of the operating system, plus your other programs you might have. 
So we started developing a kernel in 1990. The Free Software Foundation hired a programmer to write our kernel. But I chose an ambitious, elegant, powerful design that turned it into a research project. And it took many years to get it to run, and it doesn't run all that well. It's too bad. But fortunately, we didn't have to wait for it, because in 1992, another programmer unrelated to us named Linus Torvalds freed his proprietary kernel Linux. So Linux in 1991 was proprietary. In 1992, he made it free software. Well, Linux was a kernel. So once it became free software, it filled this last gap in the GNU system. So we got a combination, which is GNU plus Linux. But the people who combined it were not us, because we still thought that our kernel would soon be working well, and it would be much better, because it had this advanced, elegant design. So other people combined the various pieces of the GNU system with Linux as one more piece, and they made a complete system, which was basically GNU but contained Linux as well. However, they got confused and they started calling the whole thing Linux, which is not fair to us. So if somebody says Linux and he is a programmer and he's talking to about technical things, maybe he really means Linux, which is this one component. But in discussions for ordinary users, if somebody says Linux, what he really means is GNU plus Linux. And if you want to be fair to us and help us, just say GNU plus Linux. It's, you know, may, if people are aware that this system comes from our campaign for freedom, it'll make them think about freedom. And that's a very important thing. What about uh, uh, free software in schools? Schools have a moral duty to teach only free software exclusively. And this is more than just a way to save some money, which sometimes it is. But that's a minor secondary benefit. This is about how to do a good education instead of a bad education. Because teaching students to use a proprietary program is implanting dependence on a particular company. And that goes against the social mission of the school, of all schools, all educational activities, which is to educate good citizens of a strong, capable, independent, cooperating, and free society. In computing, this means educating capable users of free software who are ready to live in freedom. Why do many developers of proprietary software offer gratis copies of their non-liber software to the school. They want to use the school to make the students dependent, and then they hope that those students will pull all the rest of society into dependence. So the school teaches the students to use this non-free software they become dependent and then they graduate. And after they graduate, the same developer does not offer them gratis copies. And some of them go to work for companies. The developer does not offer those companies gratis copies. It's just like giving the school drugs, addictive drugs, to give to the students, saying the first dose is gratis. Once you're dependent, then you have to pay. The school would reject the drugs even if they're gratis, and it should reject the proprietary software even if it's gratis. The schools must help people be strong and independent, not push them into dependence. Another reason is for educating the good programmers, because some people are natural born programmers. Typically at 10 to 13, these people are fascinated with programming, if they use a program, they want to know, how does it do this? How does it work? Fifty years ago, they would have taken the television set apart and put it back together again, or at least the radio. 
But now they want to understand what's inside software. But if it's proprietary, the teacher can only respond, I'm sorry, we can't find out how it works. It's a secret. It's all hidden from us. Which means education is not permitted. A proprietary program is the enemy of the spirit of education, so it must not be permitted in a school. Schools must demonstrate their loyalty to the spirit of education. However, if the program is free, the teacher can explain what he knows and then say, here's the source code, read it and you'll understand everything. And those kids will read it because they're fascinated, they yearn to understand. And the teacher can say, if there's any point you can't figure out by yourself, show it to me, please, and we'll figure it out together. Well, that's very important because every time one of these gifted children comes across something that she can't understand, that means it's not clearly written. How do you develop from a natural born programmer to a good programmer? you have to learn to write clear code that other programmers will be able to understand. And the way you learn that is by is the hard way. You see some code which is hard to understand and then you learn, I shouldn't write it that way. That's not good. The way you learn to write good clear code is by reading lots of code and writing lots of code. Well only free software gives you the chance to read the code of large programs we really use and then the chance to try changing it. Most of the work in programming is changing existing large programs. The way you learn to do that is by practicing it. You do it. So you need some existing large programs to change and only free software is available for that. So every school can offer students the chance to, to master the skill of programming well, but only if it's a free software school. However, there's an even deeper reason, and that is for moral education. Education and citizenship, which is something badly needed nowadays. Schools have to go beyond teaching facts and skills. They have to teach the spirit of goodwill, the habit of helping other people. So, every class must have the following rule. Students, if you bring a program to class, you may not keep it for yourself. You must share copies with the rest of the class, including source code in case someone wants to learn, because this class is a place where we share our knowledge. Therefore, bringing proprietary software to class is not allowed. Of course, the class, the school, they have to follow the same rule. They can't bring proprietary software to class and tell you that you can't. They have to bring only free software to class and share copies, including source code, with everyone in the class. Schools shape the future of society, and they must direct society towards freedom in the virtual world. It is the war on sharing, a war against free software too? No, there's a war on sharing and that is that media companies for the most part are trying to prevent the public from using the benefits of digital technology which include f fundamentally the ability to copy and transmit information. Well the media companies don't want us to be able to copy and they have perverted our technology into our prison guards to stop us from copying. Ordinary PCs today are designed with malicious hardware that exists specifically to make it hard for the users to copy video. But it's not just video that they do this to, they do it to music. You've probably heard of music streaming services. Well, they transmit in a secret encrypted format for the sole purpose of making it hard for users to share music. Now, sharing is good. You should share music and video and books and so on with your friends. And anything that is designed to stop you, whether it's perverted technology, 
which of course proprietary software often has. The hardware exists, but in order to activate it, they need proprietary software also. And sometimes it's just software that they implement, that they use to implement these digital handcuffs. And so this is one of the reasons you should insist on free software, to reject this malicious kind of feature. Of course, there are other ways they try to stop people from sharing. They started with propaganda. For instance, they say that sharing is theft or that it's piracy. Well, actually, legally speaking, it's false. It's not theft, and piracy is attacking ships. So they're just lying, and they're doing these lies to attack people's freedom. But they didn't stop there. They then have laws that are unjust that are aimed specifically at sharing. For instance, when they implement these digital handcuffs, malicious functionalities to try to make it hard to share, of course people develop free software to break the handcuffs. So the European Union, like the US, makes those free programs illegal. So this is a law directly aimed mm -hmm. to make the people helpless in front of a company. It proves the mean spirit of laws, that the laws serve business instead of serving the people. And then in some countries, people are punished for the mere accusation of sharing which means that for the sake of those companies, the governments are willing to abolish the basic principle of justice. No punishment without a fair trial. They think a trial is unnecessary. Proof of the accusation is unnecessary because requiring proof would be inefficient. So we need to abolish the war on sharing. We need to legalize sharing. We need to ban digital handcuffs, all the malicious, perverse functionalities designed to stop people from sharing. Um, uh, Richard, what about blogging? Blogging is useful. <laughs> it's useful. <laughs> okay. It's a way of publishing your views or your experiences or anything on the net. So I'm all in favor of it. Now, there is a problem with Microsoft's blogging site. It appears that you can't even see the text without running non-free JavaScript programs. This is a bad thing. I'm not sure it's always true, but it appears to be true some of the time. Uh, where did this logo come from? This logo? GNU. Yeah. Oh, well, the name GNU is a joke because it's a recursive acronym. GNU stands for GNU's Not Unix. So programmers love recursive humor. However, it's also the name of an animal that lives ah, in Africa. GNU. Yes. Yeah. So I chose it because it's a recursive acronym but since it's the name of that animal, we use images of that animal as our symbol. I like very much the song, the GNU song. The, the GNU song? Do you mean the Flanders and Swan, I'm yeah. a GNU? Yeah, I like <laughs> that a, too. I'm a GNU. <laughs> the point is that there is a lot of humor in English around the word GNU, which made it more attractive as a name, because if you're picking a, a name that's a joke, the more people use it in other jokes, the better joke it is. Gata? Okay. Uh, Richard, thank you very much for this interview. Uh, of course, it's free. <laughs> well, for actually, since I believe that works that you use to do practical jobs ethically must be free. But this isn't a work that's designed for people to use to do a practical job with. It's designed to present my views. That's a different category of works. And so the license I recommend for works that state opinions is the Creative Commons No Derivatives license, which says that people can redistribute it, but they can't change it. We, we don't, uh, we don't uh, want to change 
to be changed. Yes. Uh, and uh, we fight, uh, like you, uh, for uh, the true and uh, for the real, uh, for freedom, for uh, real informations. Um, because uh, uh, we know that uh, uh, information is power. Well, yeah, and it's even more so when that information is the software that your activities depend on. Yes, of because course. Because if you control that software, but, but you, we, we use uh, uh, free software. You do? Yeah. Well, I'm glad you do. <laughs> well, you, you asked me about examples. You should have said you were an example. Yeah. <laughs> we have uh, uh, Office, Open Office. Ah, well, that's free software. Yeah. Now, nowadays, the recommended free version is a, a variant called LibreOffice. LibreOffice, okay. Yeah. <laughs> because, you see, Open Office was named that way by a company that was in the open source camp. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that what they're doing is bad. You have to judge it by the details of what was done. But in fact, because of their philosophy, they did things that were bad. For instance, they had a list of extensions. And in those extensions, they included some non-free extensions. Because they didn't see anything, they weren't driven by an ethical rejection of non-free software. They wanted to make their program as successful as possible. Their own program was free software, but they saw no harm in advertising, the, suggesting the use of, of other non-free programs as add-ons. Well, with LibreOffice, the only add-ons they suggest are free. Because those people, as their name they chose shows, do care about this as a matter of freedom. Thank you for your advice. Uh, thank you, Richard, again. Uh, um, thank you very much for uh, this interview. Uh, vă mulțumim și dumneavoastră că ne-ați urmărit. Uh, uh, ne puteți revedea mâine dimineață între 7 și 8. Nu uitați să intrați pe platforma www nașul.tv, pe pagina noastră de Facebook byalexa.tv sau să ne scrieți la mailul emisiunii byalexa.nașul.tv oh, no. Vă dorim noapte bună și nu uitați să fiți iubiți! I am light, I am infinite, I am the channel, I am expanding, I am psychedelic, I am vibration, I am timeless, I am unity, I am activating. A un ritmo de siete compases, entonces si les parece un poco... Uh, Confu un poco confuso no es un error por ejemplo es este ritmo join us now and share the software you'll be free hackers you'll be free Join us now and share the software. You'll be free, hackers, you'll be free. Hoarders can get piles of money. That is true, hackers, that is true. But they cannot help their neighbors. That's not good, hackers. That's not good. When we have enough free software at our call, hackers at our call, We'll kick out those dirty licenses evermore, hackers evermore. Join us now and share the software. You'll be free, hackers, you'll be free. Join us now and share the software. You'll be free, hackers, you'll be free.